In recent years, there has been a significant increase of the demand to learn English in Algeria, and it is constantly growing. I mean, just look around you and take notice of all the private schools that sprang up from nowhere. In addition to that, we've got now English-speaking Algerian YouTubers. We even have an Algerian TV channel in English. It is absolutely astonishing to observe the difference between now and just five years ago. In conclusion, the demand for English in Algeria is real and undeniable. In this episode, we're going to talk about learning English in Algeria, but with one difference. I won't be the one talking about it. Since we are talking about English, wouldn't it be cool to have the perspective of a native English speaker? If only I could bring someone here. Well, guess what? I did just that. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest today is a British teacher of English coming all the way from Liverpool. He has kindly accepted my invitation and has agreed to talk over the following points. First of all, he'll talk about his experience living and teaching in Algeria. Second, he'll talk about, about the demand for English in Algeria. And lastly, he will give his top tips for Algerian teachers and learners. Curious to find out? Well, stick around for the third episode of Mahdi's Mic. Sash. You ain't slaying a stop, I pull up parking lots, you ain't a range of rocks. I know that you think it's hard, cause you seen it done. Slash hard, you was buzz, never be your own. Man, can you understand how I came in the game? Yeah, me neither no breathing. It's amazing I made my way out the other side of my personal mate. I was done for Hello guys, my name is Mahdi and welcome to another episode of Mahdi's Mic. In this podcast series, I receive English speakers from different backgrounds and different nationalities. The aim is to create content in English, but most importantly, it is also to exchange ideas and opinions. So whether you are a learner of English or a proficient speaker, it doesn't matter because the series is suitable for both. With that being said, it's time to get this episode started. Yes, as I said in the intro, my guest today is British. And if you have listened to my previous podcast, you notice that I briefly talked about him as being the man who has worked relentlessly as being the man who has worked his fingers to the bone just to open the very first library at the British Council Algeria. I'm of course talking about the one and lonely Sir Suet Besson. Hello, Suet. Thank you, Mehdi. <laughs> Thank you, Mehdi. I've never been called Sir before in that contest. That's great. You're a Sir here. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank the you. people have chosen to give you the title of knighthood. And that's it. It's yeah. the people who count the most. It's people who I love the most. So I feel even more blessed and honoured by giving that, uh, that nationality. How are you, Mehdi? You okay? I'm great. Thank you for coming. Thank you for accepting the invitation. How are you, Suet? I'm all right, thank you. Yeah, yeah, we've got... Um, I leave for England next week, so I'm starting to get excited about Christmas. Christmas in England. So my heart is breaking because I'm leaving Algeria. Oh, man. But you'll be back. I'll be back, of you'll course. You'll be back, of course. Of course. Are you ready for my questions? Indeed, yeah. yeah. All right, so Suet, my first question is, obviously, it's very simple. So I know you, you are my colleague, but the audience don't know you so uh, what can you can you introduce yourself yeah. to the audience okay so my name is as you said before uh, Stuart Bisson and I'm 37 years of, uh, old and uh, I've been teaching English as a language teacher now for just over well over 10 years uh, in various different countries um, I was a teacher in England I was a primary school teacher in England for a few years and I left Britain because it's very difficult to find employment it's very difficult to find jobs so there is this perception that um, Britain is the land of milk and honey. You know, mm. the, the pavements are lined with gold. It's very, very easy to find uh, jobs, but yeah. it's not. It's very, very difficult. So I see myself as an economic migrant. I'm very fortunate to come to your country to, to contribute in a very, very small way mm. to English language development. Very small way, but contribution nonetheless. Yeah, and I think that's the thing about teaching, isn't it? Because going into this job, no one will ever be a millionaire doing it. We're never going to get rich. We're never going to have <laughs> five or six cars. But it's the human interest, isn't it? It's the human interest. It's the um, it's the fact that you make a difference to somebody's life. And I hope that maybe 20, 30, 40 years in the future, 
maybe my primary school uh, students will remember my name. You know, they won't just remember the face or remember him. You know, they'll remember my name and they'll think, well, okay, yeah, you know, I got into English because of, of the teacher. So. Well, I know I'll remember your name. <laughs> For all the good things, hopefully. <laughs> all, the all the good things. Of course, man, of course. You. Um, okay, so my next question would be, so not a lot of Algerian have the chance to visit England. So we mm -hmm. don't really know England that much. We it's not like France. Yeah. Like there are a lot of Algerian who visit France every year. So can you tell us about the place where you, where you grew up, uh, life in England? Yeah, yeah. Can you just give us a taste? Yeah, of, yeah. of England. I know it's no, no, no. Hard, but it's uh, great because I'm <laughs> I'm the cultural ambassador for Liverpool. Oh yeah. Because everybody knows London, right? And Britain is, it's a nice country, it's big, but it's more than just London. And Liverpool culturally is possibly even more significant than, than London. Really? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, wow. for instance, in the 1940s, um, <coughs> 1950s, because Liverpool is a port city like Algiers, mm. um, people used to travel to and from America on ships and they would mm. take culture from America mm. and bring it back to, to Britain, but to Liverpool first. So things like uh, records, you know, the old vinyl records. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. So a lot of the music from uh, America came to Britain via Liverpool, and that's one of the things about the city because of its uh, musical background, its musical heritage. Okay. There's lots of different influences from, from the Americas. Um, culturally, also, we've had a lot of uh, great writers mm. uh, over the years. Such as? Uh, yeah, come to think of it, who have we got? <laughs> a lot of playwrights, a lot of, um, a lot of people who have written um, film scripts uh, yeah. over the years. In fact, the guy that um, devised, he, he created the opening ceremony mm. of the mm. Olympic Games in 2012. Uh, his family come from where I live. Oh, okay. Come from the small village where I live. Really? This, the same? The same? Well, yeah. Oh, Frank Cottrell Boyce. Oh, yeah, yeah, Frank Cottrell Boyce. So he's uh, he's written a few sort of, of film scripts for the the director Danny Boyle. He did oh. Train Spotting. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Da Gray. Danny Boyle is the one who uh, directed um, Slam Dunk Millionaire. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So those two yeah. guys have worked in, in collaboration with each other, and this guy, yeah, he created the the opening montage, the opening ceremony, the mm. themes of the of the um, Olympic Games. So people have always been in Liverpool very. Um, keen to express themselves, you know, they're flamboyant, they're mm. outgoing. Um, they say that Liverpool is a city but with a village mentality and that's not meant to say in a bad way, but it's it's the sense that you know each other without really knowing each other. You could call each mm. other friend, mm. mate and all that, mm -hmm. sort of, all that sort of stuff. And it's very similar, I think, to, to Algiers. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like now listening to you describing like people in Liverpool, I feel like you are descri describing a little bit Algerian. Like yeah, when yeah, you say yeah. flamboyant, yeah. I mean... Well, that's the thing. I think as a teacher, when you go to different countries, you see more similarities and differences. And I think that's always the case. It's, oh, yeah. It's always, well, in my country, we do this, and in your country, you do mm. that. And da, 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 da. But really, the more that you do this this job, the more that we're all the same. Really. Oh, yeah. You know, and there's more similarities than differences. Exactly. You've become, like, I don't know, like a multicultural yeah, yeah. person, mm. like a citizen of the world. Yeah. Just like you become a foreigner, like you, because you embrace a lot of uh, different cultures, different traditions, different ideas. Oh yeah. Because yeah. you travel a lot and you get in touch with different people, so you discover a lot of things, and you might uh, adapt or adopt some of those yeah. things along the way. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, you know, I take other people's culture and bring it back to to Britain. I mean, for instance, now. You know, I don't have sandwiches. I make my parents bocadillos, which is, I mean, you know, in Spanish. Yeah, Spanish. Uh, <laughs> and it's great. That's very cool. And it's beautiful. Do I mean, they love it? They, uh, I hope they do, yeah. Oh, okay. they, they smile as they eat it. Hopefully they, that, that's yeah. a good sign. Uh, <laughs> they smile at the uh, initiative. They're not choking on it. Yeah, uh, yeah, that, that, they're that, still alive. That, just about, okay. yeah, just about. That's the most important. Um, so my next question, will, we're going to move bit forward in time mm -hmm. and uh, I would like to ask you about your studies and your background studies wise what did you study at mm -hmm. the university yeah yeah um, 
Well, the way that I see it is I've always been in education. So for the first 18 years of my life, I was a student. And then for the next, um, let's think, like 17 years or 18 years or so, uh, I've been in education as a teacher or at university studying. So when I, um, when I first went to university, I studied uh, primary school education, mm. um, which was a four year course. And it was studying uh, all the subjects to be taught at primary school, but also focusing on English as well as a speciality. Mm. Um, so that was really interesting. I did that for four years. That's the longest degree you can do to become a teacher. And when I graduated, um, I didn't go straight into teaching. I, I took a job in a supermarket okay. for nine months because I needed some cash. Um, and in some ways, it was the best thing that I ever did because when I did my MA, they said in one of the reports that teachers ought to take time away from the classroom, do something mm. completely different. Mm -hmm. So go and get some life experience by working in a shop or mm. go and work uh, outdoors, yeah. doing something completely different. Yeah. Come back to it a year later and you will feel, you know, you'll have the people skills for yeah, the job. Yeah. So I did that for, for nine months. Um, but unfortunately, in the UK, the job market, as I said at the start, <clears throat> is very, very difficult. Um, and this was, you know, the case over 10 years ago. What it's like now must be even harder mm. because it's so, so hard to find a job. And lots of teachers graduate, but then they don't find a job. And almost the tradition is that teachers go into working in call centers, mm. you know, they take lesser paid mm. jobs, yeah. and people aren't using their degrees. So I sort of, worked as a part-time teacher in England doing cover really oh, yeah. which is what we have at the BC um, and also worked in different countries which I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely and how old were you when you graduated? Yeah I was 20, 23, 23. I, I know that you did your master's as well yeah, you, have, yeah. you have you've got an MA in, in, in yeah. what? International Sorry? education oh, yeah okay. yeah okay um, just to sort of, because I had a foot in both camps, you know, I taught in England, I taught in other countries. Mm. And the provision of language teaching in Britain is poor. Mm -hmm. You know, in four years, we didn't have any lessons about teaching French as a second language or teaching Spanish as a second mm. language. Mm. Um, but then sometimes as a cover teacher, the next lesson that you're preparing yourself for is French or Spanish. Mm. So you're thinking about your, my baccalaureate in England, right? Uh, de, toi, quatre, okay, <laughs> right. Bonjour, je m'appelle, dans ma chambre, il y a une, and all that sort of stuff. And that's how English people are. So we're not, we're not taught languages from an early age. Um, and what I wanted to do was to bring the MA as a way of getting back into education, but also as a way of sort of trying to um, promote you know, what is a huge, huge area of education, isn't it? So, um... You said that you have taught for 10 years, mm. right? So, um, you're an experienced teacher. Ish. ish. And, uh, <laughs> and you have taught mostly overseas. Yeah, yeah. So, my question is, how old were you when you first left England for mm. your first job and where was it? Like, yeah. Can you, yeah, can you talk us... Uh, Talk about a little bit about your first experience, your sure, first sure, experience yeah. abroad, working abroad. Yeah, I mean, I um, let's think. I mean, I, I graduated in 2004. I worked in a supermarket for a year, and I was still applying for jobs in England to try and get a teacher, uh, mm. but just, just didn't get anywhere. You know, I had one or two interviews, and that was it. Uh, funnily enough, in London, because that's mm. where all the jobs are. Yeah. Um, so I did my CELTA in 2005 um, as a way of trying to sort of give myself an extra skill set yeah. and try and yeah. um, make myself more employable. And then in the September of 2006, that's when I got my first job, um, through a newspaper, through a national newspaper, applying for an, an advert in The Guardian. Oh, The Guardian. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a real teacher's yeah. paper. It's left wing. Yeah. It's you know, th about socialism. Yeah, yeah. Like. I, I checked. They have a lot of job opportunities uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. on the website. And it, Okay, on the guard. Okay, yeah. that's cool. That's and that was pretty the, cool. This was a time before the internet, almost. You know, yeah, a time before yeah, smartphones yeah. and all that sort of malarkey. You know, uh, and it was in uh, in Portugal. Uh, so I went down, met the guy in London for an interview, and um, started in his school, a very very small school. I mean, there must have been like four or five classrooms. Mm. 
in a place called uh, Via Nova de Famalicão in the, the north of Portugal, so closer to, to Braga. Island, right? Uh, but this is on the mainland. Oh, this okay. is, yeah. So it's between Braga and Porto, which oh, is okay. the second city. Um, and that was great for, because for me, that was the, the opportunity to get, to get familiar with the mm. English language. Mm. I mean, you know, yeah, I, te I speak here, but do I know it? Do I know how it works? Mm. All right? I mean, before that, you know, what is a present simple? Yeah. What is a past continuous? Exactly. When do you uh -huh. use it? Uh -huh. When? Like, when? when do you use it? How do you form it? Like, I, I don't think about that. I just, it's just yeah. I just acquired it, so. And that's it, isn't it? And, that, and I think that's what makes uh, teachers of English mm. um, and also students of English much, much better at using my language than the native speakers are because we make so many errors in our speaking. We make so, so many really? errors. Absolutely. You listen to any footballer's interview after a match and they can't use the past simple of the verb to be. They get confused between what nah. and were. Are okay. you kidding me? We was we was beaten by a, a better team today. We That's was gutted. True. We was gutted That's by that true. result. That, right? I I hear it a lot in like by Americans. Mm -hmm. Americans they would say we was mm. or uh, you was. That's right. I mean that's wow. You know like that's it's it's like uh, it sounds almost alien. Yeah. Because like we I don't know there is this conception that like native speakers they don't make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So and what you are saying now might be extremely surpri surprising oh, yeah. to the audience yeah, like no, no. and coming from a, from a native speaker i mean if a non native speaker would have said it like he, he would lack some credibility mm -hmm. yeah like he but now for me even for me like i i know that it's it happens but yeah i mean it's interesting to hear you saying it and and just to show that we are humans and oh, yeah, yeah, yeah like we yeah. make mistakes like even there's yeah. like this myth like even native speakers make mistakes mm -hmm. even in my language mm -hmm. like when sometimes i'm talking arabic or derija it's like i make mistakes okay yeah it's 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 something very human yeah yeah i mean this is an example of uh, they call it non-standard dialect form you know and i suppose the question you, you then you ask is well is it right to make mistakes or is it like completely wrong to mm. make mistakes because we're living in an era now where, you know, we're sending text messages, we're sending emails. The things that we send, I mean, are they co grammatically correct? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so the one thing I would say is, is, is to your listeners is make sure that when you are going to learn English, be taught by an Algerian teacher, all right? <laughs> really? Don't trust the English, all right? Because I could stand at the front, I could stand at the front and, and teach a lesson that would be false, mm. okay? But because I'm English, the perception is, well, this guy must know what he's talking about, mm -hmm. okay? You know, mm -hmm. because we respect the teacher, we respect this guy who's come from mm. another country, yeah. bringing his language. Yeah. But like any teacher, like you say, we are all human and we do make an awful lot of mistakes. And I actually think that uh, teachers, whether they are here in Algeria teaching English in other countries, because they've been used to the language for so yeah. long and yeah. how it's been taught, well, you guys know grammar much, much better than I do. Mm. Okay, I mean, I can hear the differences. I can hear yeah. and assume what's right and what's wrong, but how it works, when it's used, <coughs> ask an Algerian teacher. Don't and, ask me. <coughs> and does that, like, does it put pressure on you, like, to have students' expectation, like, expecting you to know everything? Mm. Like, when you go in the classroom and they say, this is a native speaker, he knows the language perfectly. Does that... Uh, add pressure on you? I think it's, um, I think what they, they do get is a level of authenticity. Mm. So like we said before, if you hear mistakes with the verb to be, okay, mm. we can correct it. Um, but they are getting a teacher that isn't used to um, how Algerian students are educated. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I know when I go into my classrooms, the emphasis <coughs> is on, it is quite relaxed and it's quite jovial, it's, it's quite fun. Mm. Um, but I sometimes think that probably we, we, we may do more speaking than we actually should do. We should actually concentrate more on doing the grammar, doing mm. the board work. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm sympathetic to, to what students need, what they want. You know, I'm mm. quite happy for them to, to speak probably longer than I would really like to, yeah. but that's an activity that 
I think in, in, in Algeria people enjoy, you know, people are more comfortable speaking, speaking. rather than actually doing the, the grammar, the, mm. uh, the mechanics of the language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think we are getting ahead of, of ourselves. All oh, right, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we are like jumping ahead, but that's cool. Um, before this is, we will have the chance to talk about it after that, but yeah. coming back, so we have spoken about your first job experience, which mm. was in Portugal. Yeah, it was, yeah. yeah. And so now, can you tell us a, a little bit about your experience teaching abroad? So what were the countries you yeah. taught in? Was it for a long time? Was it enjoyable? Mm. I get itchy feet, Maddy. I, I really get itchy feet. And already now I'm thinking about the next job, you know, because you have to stay one step of the game. Mm. Um, I mean, I have to confess that the longest I've ever had a job for is for two years in the mm. same place. Yeah. Um, because because of the nature of work, because of the nature of the world we live in, we're living on short-term contracts mm. and I have to go where the work is. So mm. um, I had a year in Portugal, which was great, you know, it was, which was okay. I met a lot of people. Uh, the Portuguese are very similar to the Algerians in terms of mindset, I think, you know, very, very um, motivated towards learning. Um, English, much more than the Spanish, I would mm. say. Um, then I went back to England to do some supply work, tried to find a job, couldn't do that. And then went to the island of Madeira, which is uh, a Portuguese colony. Oh, okay. Um, so it's off the coast of Africa. Um, mm. And that was that was really nice. That was a time when, I don't know, you, you, you look back on your life, don't you? You think, well, actually, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was. Yeah. Um, so I did that for a year, then went to Spain, which was the opposite because that was a little bit of a crazy time. Um, went away, did my MA, and mm. then it was in exactly the same position, you know, this time with two degrees, but still unemployed. You went back after Spain, you went back to do your MA. I did, yeah. Okay. What made it hard was that um, in England, if you qualify as a teacher, you only have a limited time in which to teach. Mm. So I know, for instance, you had your NQT year last yeah. year. And the same thing applies to me. Um, when you graduate, you still have to do your induction period. You still have mm. to be monitored, assessed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if you don't do that within five years, that's it. It's, really? Yeah. Like you lose your yeah. degree? Yeah, I was, I was on the scrap heap by the age of 30. I mean, I was unemployable, you know. I couldn't go back into the classroom, I couldn't teach. Um, because you didn't teach for five years, like exactly, you didn't yeah. go through that, That's that right, process. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. um, so the way of doing the MA was to sort of try as a last ditch opportunity to get back into British education, mm. couldn't do that. Um, but also then maybe to sort of move away from Britain and go mm. abroad. Mm. And uh, yeah, the next job was in uh, Mecca of all places, oh, wow. the big one. Right. Uh, so I was in my pajamas. Damn dog! <laughs> I was in my pajamas on a laptop, applying for all these jobs, and uh, and there we go. And that, that's that's where that was my first uh, Islamic country that I talked to. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that was. And Mecca. That was yeah. As a non-Muslim, I, I we had to live in a hotel for three months in okay. Jeddah, and every day we travelled in the minibus to Mecca. So okay. An hour and a half there, an hour and a half back, so three hours. Commuting. But what made it worse was the Saudis, the, the, you know, the, the interpretation of the religion is very different, mm -hmm. all right? And mm -hmm. there's a Muslim road mm -hmm. and there's a non-Muslim road. Really? And unfortunately... Like, is it literal or... You no, no, about... it is literally... A... Really? Yeah, yeah, so you go onto the motorway. It's like the street, like their street is yeah. for non-Muslims. That's right, which is, which is bad because... Oh, man. That's segregation. That's right. I mean, we were on, uh, we were in a minibus. Uh, like with the boys, it was all the boys, you know, wow. it was all segregated. So it's like 10 of us, so maybe, you know, 70, 80% of it were, were, you know, Muslim guys, you know, Muslim teachers from America, mm. from Canada, from Britain. But because there was me and like one or two other, guys, other two other teachers, couldn't go the short way, which would have been 45 minutes. Oh, wow. We had to go an hour and a half. But taking these positives, because that's what the, the religion's all about, being positive. I think one of the nice things was actually going through the desert okay. at sunrise. All right. That's, that sounds that, pretty cool. That was nice. You know, you sort of see the mountains and the sun. What time was that? What? 
Uh, well, we what used time to... does the sun rise? Well, we left Jeddah. At, used to leave at half six every morning. Wow. That was dark. That was just night time. And then we used to get to the get to Mecca about what uh, half past seven, quarter to eight, more or less. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're driving down this road, you know, this this long stretch of road. And yeah, the, the, the sun comes out over the mountains and the sun in the, the Middle East is like twice the size that it is here in Algeria. Mm -hmm. So it's beautiful, it's mm -hmm. beautiful. But mm -hmm. the only thing is, all right, the Saudis can't drive. They really can't drive. All right? There are so many accidents, fatalities. Oh, yeah. Bad and, drivers. And what made it worse was, you know, going to Mecca on this very, very straight road, okay? And even if you had a car behind you, they would always want to overtake. Mm. We saw a lot of fatalities, a lot of deaths. You know, literally, I had about two or three students in the campus who died, you know, uh, just because really? of car accidents. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the great things now is that women are being allowed to drive in, in Saudi. They've lifted the law, mm. they've lifted the ban. Mm. But why anybody would want to drive there, I'm not quite sure because it is pretty dangerous. I, Every car's got Are a you saying that women will cause more accidents? No, no. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm saying it's a great thing in terms of equality. Have you heard that Saudis? <laughs> Only to the uh, Saudi women out there. I am. Well, it's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing that. Well, but why anybody want to drive there, I don't know. Oh, but, yeah. but yeah, we, we, when we saw like pe petrol tankers mm. that had been burst into flames, you know, um, I mean, it's just crazy, you know. Mm. Um, so yeah, and then, and then last one was, um, after doing that for a bit, I got a job in Morocco. And um, we talked about Saudi Arabia being very, very different. I think Morocco yeah. and Algeria is very different too. Oh, okay. How long did you stay in uh, Saudi? It was for three months because oh, yeah. it was a bit of a crazy situation. I think one of the things about being a TEFL teacher is that you get parachutes into the situation and you just have to cope with it. To deal, yeah. And it's not so much the culture shock because you know that, you know, Mecca is going to be different from mm. Liverpool. Right? Mm. There's more sand in Mecca than there is in Liverpool for a yeah. start. Um, but it was like the, the campus that I worked on was like a crossover between Star Wars, the set of Star Wars, <laughs> and, a, and Alien 3, right, oh, where the cast man. is just men, right? So you had, you know, you're working in this, uh, this campus that was like barely 50% full. We had like teachers just wandering around the place, you know, just like aimlessly. Like even the palm trees had given up and died. A lot of the palm trees were like that, you know. Um, it was a technical college. The Saudis were getting paid to learn English. Mm -hmm. And the problem was they weren't getting paid. Um, we go through a systematic process in the BC mm. where students are taught twice a week. Mm. And they go through the course book and they have assessments. Yeah. The Saudis were literally being taught the start of one book every day going through till they finished the book. Okay. And then they'd start a new book and then go through that book every single day for five. No assessments? No assessments, no planning. No exam, one, no tests. No, one teacher would take over from another teacher. They wouldn't know where one had left off. So in the space of potentially a year, you could go from beginner to pre-intermediate. Um, yeah. And you talk about the intensive course. That was yeah, intensive because yeah, yeah. they just, every day were doing like the next page, the next page, the next page. So they were fed up. So what happened was they, they brought the local press into the campus. Wow. They had, you know, protests. Um, you know, I had students who just left my class. They just got up and left. Like they just went on strike. Right? Mm. Um, so you got this like, this guy from Liverpool who just does not know what is going on here. Yeah. Right? Um, we had like teachers fighting each other. There was like a bit of scrapping going yeah. on. But yeah. what were what were they protesting about? Well, just the fact they weren't getting paid. Um, oh, the teachers. Uh, well, the the, the, the students. This, yeah. Why would they get paid? Well, this was I say this was a technical college, so they were being taught English, and then later on they were going to be taught a skill like um, mechanics okay. or uh, hospitality. But the thing about in Saudi Arabia is that you know Saudis don't speak. English, unless they're from a very wealthy family yeah. and they go abroad yeah. to study in London, what they do is they employ cheaper labour from overseas, from um, you know India, Pakistan, mm -hmm. Bangladesh, mm -hmm. um, and so they were actually you know going through this process of learning English and a technical skill, but for no reason because they weren't getting paid and 
you know, why were they doing it? There was mm. no jobs. The motivation is, yeah. yeah, it's not there. But the funny thing is, though, I like I was in Mecca and uh, one guy was pretending to have a Liverpool accent when I was there. Right. So okay. you talk about English being a global language. He, he's, uh, he's a foreigner. He was like talking like a scouser. It's like, that. It's just like, oh, just like, yeah. really, it's like oh, whoa! Yeah. <laughs> so this guy's never been to Liverpool and he's already, you know, sort of imitating the accent. Like, was wow. he uh, from Saudi Arabia? He was, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's like, how do you know this? But there you go, that's the power of uh, the language. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The lingua franca. Indeed. Um, one question. Did you meet Doug Vader? Uh, well, yeah, you see, as a teacher, I, I think you, you probably noticed this maybe once or twice, is that I do get very, um, there's a fine line between passion and sort of um, being angry, you know, and uh, <laughs> the campus was being inspected, all right, and they actually told me to stay away during the inspection period, because was, I wasn't causing trouble, but I was just like pointing out things that yeah. you might want to do better, all right? Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So unfortunately for students that, that enroll in a language course, you know, I want them to get the best experience, mm. you know, being a teacher is the best job in the world. So if I can't do my job properly, then it sucks. So yeah, I was, I was sort of told not to come during the inspection period by a type of Darth Vader mm. figure. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. So after Saudi, you went to Morocco. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And was it the the uh, the last country before you you came to Algeria. It was yeah. So I, I finished there in let's think uh, June or July of 20, 2016. I started here in August twenty sixteen. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, was, like short transition. It was three weeks between the the jobs. Yeah. So in that yeah. time, you have to get the uh, the visas, the documents. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that, yeah. that takes a lot of time. How long did you stay in in Morocco? It was for two years. For two two years. years. So that was that, as I say, that's the longest I've ever had a job for. Wow. <laughs> so I'm not really somebody who works their way up the ladder. I'm just sort of somebody who goes mm. and does a bit, a bit of work here, a bit of work there. Two years at a time. Well, yeah. <laughs> as long as they want me. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay. So now we're going to um, move to another topic, which is your arrival mm -hmm. to Algeria. So... My question is, so when so you, when did you arrive? Uh, 2016? Yeah, August. Yeah, that's right. August yeah. 2016. And so how long have you been here? Um, so it's been, let's think, August, September, October. Uh, yeah, 16 months. 16. Okay. Yeah. So um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience in Algeria? How, how is it going so far? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's like anything. I mean you don't know until you actually come to the country what it's like and from a British perspective nobody really knows what Algeria is like because either <coughs> side of Algeria, Morocco and Tunisia are tourist destinations yeah. and we have more of a, an understanding what those countries mm. are like because of holidays but I think in the middle um, Algeria you know, people don't so I came here as a you know a, an economic migrant looking for work mm. looking for employment mm. um, so I didn't know anything about the, 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 the but first, what were your, like, what were your, what was your conception of Algeria before you come? Um, I don't think I, I don't think I had any, to be honest. Mm. I mean, the only thing is, I mean, yeah, well, I remember in Morocco, they said that um, the people are very conservative. Mm. Hmm. All right. Because there is this rivalry between Morocco and Algeria. Yeah. And when yeah. I was saying to people in Morocco, I was going to go and come and work here. There was a lot of... <sighs> 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 That sort of thing, all <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. And I was thinking, well, come on, you know, and again, we talk about similarities, mm. and I think there's an awful lot of similarities between the two countries. Um, but one thing that stood out was it was conservative, which I thought was great as a teacher because it meant the students would be respectful, they would listen, they would be sincere. Mm. And I was like, oh, wow. Because after two years of working in Casablanca, those guys aren't polite, they aren't sincere all mm. the time. Um, but yeah, I didn't know anything about the, the history. I didn't know anything mm. about, you know, the, the unfortunate bombings of, of the 90s. Mm. I didn't know anything about the uh, the politics of the country. Um, I mean, for me, that is that's a huge, huge thing. It's, it's really, really important. But I'm just thinking about the people more than anything else. And, you know, 
am I going to be received really well by by my colleagues, by the people I know? Um, am I going to fit in? Are they going to sort of treat me okay? And, and of course, you know, I mean that that's what we're saying about mm. about being lost in the So. Um, yeah, like in all the jobs I've, I've worked in before, I don't know anything about it until I actually get there. Mm. Really. And how was the experience so far? Uh, it's nice. I mean, I think there's lots, again, there's always more positives than negatives. I think the positives are that it's a, it's a really nice environment uh, where I live. I mean, very clean, very, um, very, very habitable. I mean, one of the things that surprised me the most is actually just how green the country is mm. in this part. Mm. I know when it rains, it really rains, but um, just to see plants and trees, nature is, is great because mm. I think that that helps people to relax, mm. and to calm them, you know themselves down. Uh, coming from a sort of an industrial city like Casablanca, where there isn't anything like that, there is a huge, huge difference between the mentality of Moroccans and Algerians. Mm. So I think the natural environment is great. I think the people have been really, really welcoming, um, especially because English isn't isn't yet becoming. Um, a dominant force here mm. in, in Algeria. Uh, people are very interested, very inquisitive about, you know, uh, the language itself, the culture, what it's like to mm. live in, in Britain. Um, I think maybe it's quiet, it's possibly a bit too conservative. Mm. Uh, as a Western guy, I feel like I've been corrupted by society a little bit. And there are things that I sort of miss that I would like to, to sort of do here as well. But, um, no, I think it's been really nice. It's been a really pleasant experience. Mm. Can you elaborate on the last part? Uh, <laughs> Let's call a spade a spade, really? man. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, I think I'm of the mentality that if you work hard, then you, you have fun at the weekend. So, mm. um, yeah, we, you know, we all do five days a week and we're single guys and we just want to go out and meet people, have fun. Um, I've been to... A few uh, a few nights out with with Weber, who's mm. our colleague yeah, at DC, yeah. uh, and we've been to a, a nightclub in the in the um, Saint George. Okay. Oh yeah, uh, and that is a very different side to Algeria, which mm. yep. um, I'm, I'm sort of more familiar with back in England than possibly. <laughs> But you know that that that's that that's what it is. But um, but yeah yeah. I mean it's just things like that. It's just being able to. I think also, it, it, it's the sense of being like restricted a little mm. bit. I do feel like I'm. I can't really do what I want to do. Like mm. I mean, even like going out for a coffee. I want to sit. I want to just chat with people. Um, but uh, I can't really do the, the little things, which yeah. I'm starting to sort of miss a yeah, little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is uh, something that uh, I have experienced myself, and uh, I would say that Algiers is, as you know, I'm not from Algiers, I'm from Oran, <clears throat> and I'll, they're different. I mean, in Oran, people are easygoing, they're very uh, talkative, very sociable. It's very easy to just start a conversation with a total stranger, and mm -hmm. and he might become a friend. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. it's that easy, but coming here to Algiers, I mean, I think the first months were pretty difficult because I knew people, but I didn't have friends. Okay, you know, I had I had colleagues, I had I knew people, but they weren't really people like you could you like you could be friends with and you could like confide in. You know, so and uh, to be honest, like it's still now. I mean, yeah. the all people in Algiers, they this is just my opinion, but they have like a you need to go through a protocol mm -hmm. before like they get <laughs> I don't know like they get close to a person or you become actually a friend with someone. So it's it's something that that I I. I have experience and I share uh, with you. So, do you think it's a capital city thing? Do you think <coughs> it's the, the mentality of being in a big, big city where people are busy, pace of life is maybe a bit quicker? Than... I I think so, absolutely. I think here people are stressed. They and the thing is here people they go out less. First of all, it's due to historical uh, events in the 90s. It was here. It was a yeah. very, um, let's say unstable and yeah it was unstable and a lot of terrorist attacks mm. uh, happened in Algiers mm. so it was a pretty a pretty scary place to be which is the opposite of Oran Oran we didn't have any 
terrorist attacks and we were just like hearing echoes like attack here attack there but here in Algiers it was like the headquarters mm, yeah and uh, so people like they develop this reflex of once it's dark they go home you know it's not yeah. safe to go out uh, yeah. at night and maybe I think that this reflex stayed with them it didn't go away I mean it's changing but it's 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 slowly it's mm -hmm. not it didn't change completely like people are starting to go out but not as they as they should or as it is possible to do and uh, here so that's one thing and also people they are stressed out the whole week a lot of traffic as you might have uh, seen and so they just, they're just exhausted and they just want to stay home yeah at the yeah. weekend and just chill I mean one of the things like every time every after every weekend I ask my students how was your weekend so they would just say, yeah regular weekend <laughs> stay home sleep well that's a similarity Pray. between britain and uh, algeria yeah it is. really yeah i think so i think it is when we come home like we close the doors close the curtains and that's it you know and we sort of we're quite sort of solitary whereas uh, what's interesting is here we are and we're in a mediterranean country mm. you know and, and sometimes as a as a as a britain a, Brit, a british guy i forget that you know they're in a british mm. uh, sorry a, a mediterranean climate and that lends itself to an outdoor existence. It mm. lends itself mm. to spending time yeah. with lots of people and, and yeah, so yeah. socializing maybe uh, a little bit more. You know what's surprising? This this like matter. I, I've discussed it with people from like friends, people I know from Algiers, mm -hmm. and I've told them like it's difficult for me to make friends here, like real friends, you know. Okay. And they were like they offered help and everything and honestly like it's something that I cannot explain in like using words but what is surprising is that 2 years ago I I lived in Indonesia for 7 months it was my first time no no it wasn't my first time abroad it was my first time living abroad mm -hmm. and first time going out of out of home first time living by myself but what what strikes me is that I managed to adapt and, and have a, my own circle of friends mm -hmm. and have a life and have like uh, yeah. no people have my things set up okay. quicker than here in Algiers. I have been in, Alg in Indonesia like after three months. I mean, I remember like I've been to this house party and that house party just completely changed my, my, my stay because yeah. I've met a lot of people there and that's how I made my circle of friends. But here in Algiers, I've been here for more than a year and a half and um, like honestly speaking, I, I don't have real friends. Like the only friends I have, I have colleagues, I have people I know, but not friends. The only friends I have, like they are back in Oran. Mm. So it's... Uh, it's strange. Maybe the audience might comment on that. Yeah, they yeah. might give us their input. Yeah, but I suppose, do, do you think you changed as a person because of your experience in Indonesia? If you if you hadn't have traveled, if you'd stayed here all your life, mm. would you have been uh, aware of of how easier it is to to make friends? Um, I don't think so. I, I think that experience definitely changed me like a lot. Yeah. And uh, and. You cannot go and change like after such an experience, you know. Mm -hmm. You have been to in Indonesia, you know how different it is. Yeah, I've been yeah, to yeah. Asia, so you cannot just live there and come back the same person. No, it's true. just impossible. So what's, what's the, been the, the one thing that has changed about you the most? Um, I think that now I rely more uh, on myself. Um, mm -hmm. I'm aware... I've, I've learned to, to know myself, you know, better mm -hmm. and what were my limits, what were the things I could do, you know, like the potential because before I had a lot of, I had a lot of things that I took for granted. Okay. You know, like you take something, you say, this is the way they are to, yeah, supposed to be. But when you travel and you come back, you start seeing things differently. Yeah. And I think the thing that changes my perspective all mm -hmm. things and how I see things now I think now I'm more appreciative of certain things that I wasn't before now I see things differently and I just have different plans for my life you know because mm -hmm. I have been abroad and 
I have met a lot of people from different nationalities and I have I have um, encountered a different ideas, different perspective and I took it the, the positive way. I, I sort of enriched myself mm -hmm. by just embracing all those different inputs that I didn't have. So perspective def definitely and and it, it it just you grow as a person yeah you know that's that's the thing like you just become more mature more wiser mm -hmm. yeah and uh, yeah because i've been doing my research on you Medi. okay oh, man. I, i've been checking your facebook, really i've been doing your, <laughs> checking your facebook page uh, on a regular basis and uh, i do get the sense that you want to in the future leave you, know, you want to go back to maybe Indonesia or go traveling, uh, but working at the same time. Is that? Is, oh, uh, man. Am, I, am I correct in my <sighs> in my sleuthing? You know, I you're right. You are right. And um, but now I think I'm starting to change my my opinion, my decision because I'll tell you, I have tried to apply for TEFL jobs mm -hmm. for almost a year now. Right. And. <laughs> I haven't got any answer. Like the few answers, they were like, uh, sorry, we like due to the regulation of uh, legislation of this country, you cannot accept because you are, yeah, you are, you, we need like certain type of countries, you know? Yeah. And um, there is, there is this thing in TEFL, like where there is this belief between this dichotomy between native English speaker and non-native, which is, something not new to us okay and uh it's killing me man really? <laughs> the, oh, this, no. this discrimination Don't. it's killing me man I, i'm like now like hell with it i'm 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 done with the yeah like i know myself I've got potential i'm done with the it's kind of humili humiliating, you know, like when you apply and you and you don't even get a response yeah so i'm just like now i'm like hell with that i'm going to stay here I'm going to start something here and I'm going just to keep my dignity and build well, something from here. I think it, it, it works both ways. I mean, it's, you know, you are right because there are some jobs that do advertise for, for native speakers, for UK or Irish mm. passport holders. And that, that's, that's true. And I suppose in today's world, that would be, you know, wrong. That would be illegal to, 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 to do that. Um, but for, again, from my experiences, the life that I have here is, is possibly very different to the life I might have anticipated mm. just a few years ago because um, it's also very difficult for, for native mm. uh, speakers to get uh, to get jobs and I think what's what stops us both from maybe going where we would like to go or to climb the ladder is is unfortunately the, the Delta qualification mm. um, and you can I mean who you know those guys that, that study hard, that get it, you know, that, mm. that's a great thing. You mm. know, and I cannot find any negatives from being better educated, better skilled. Mm. Um, but I do think that sometimes with the council it is a little bit, um, you know, you, you sort of take that as the only thing and that's it. And it's like, well, to, to hell with what you've yeah, been yeah. doing last year. So don't give up, please, many do not give up. Unless you're applying for the same job as me, all right? <laughs> Unless you're applying for BC Cuba or yeah. BC Honolulu, all right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but don't give up, all right? Stick with it. And um, and this is your second year, isn't it? Your second year. Yeah. So yeah. I think once you get the second year out of the way, then it's like, okay, now I've got that experience. You know, I've got that extra. You know, last night um, I watched this very interesting video <clears throat> about this guy, an English teacher. His name is Marek, he's from Poland, he's Polish. And he was talking about the um, native, non-native topic. Mm -hmm. okay. And he brought out some interesting statistics, like this guy really knew what he was talking about. And you know, like what he said, you know how much like the percentage of job opportunities that are like looking for native speakers mm -hmm. in the job market worldwide? No, no. 75 percent right okay and he was like okay i didn't know that nativeness is a qualification <laughs> that because i would have yeah. like i would have did i would have like studied for a master's in nativeness it's better than a phd in oh, tesla yeah and yeah. uh it was mind-blowing and he he went on and he 
he he's like he was just demystifying mm -hmm. some of the conceptions that people might have like for me i see it as a it's a business thing you yeah. know you have these schools they want to bring students they want to convince the the parents and there's like they're playing on that you know they 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 are taking advantage of that and sometimes they might even like they tell them like we are bringing a native speakers because the parents they think that their students will learn better yeah and you know what's crazier is that in china like sometimes they bring some like white people like russian hungarian and they would say he's canadian <laughs> he is okay. american it's like okay, it, yeah. it's gone that crazy you look a little bit canadian i think you got you got canadian ears yeah <laughs> canadian -ish. yeah i'm going to take a picture of my ears <laughs> and, send, and put them on my cv that's look it look at my beautiful canadian don't ears. choose the face choose the ears. <laughs> the ears but i think um i think you're right i mean it is you know yeah it, it's just down to fate, isn't it, where you're born? And that, that seems to be your qualification is, you know, your native speaker, right? You can teach. But from experience, I can honestly, honestly tell you that, you know, I've had great relationships with the Portuguese, with the Spanish, Moroccans, you know, even the Saudis, and of course here in Algeria. But the, the, the strangest people I've ever met in this industry are the English. Uh, they are the biggest weirdos I've ever met in my entire life. I mean, I think that. It's great on one sense to be taught by a native speaker, but really, A, is that native speaker a good teacher? Not always. But then I think it's, it's, the, it's the wider effect. It's the mm. how does that person integrate themselves into the different societies they belong to. And mm. you know, I could tell you some horror stories about people that I've, I've worked with or had to live with. Um, and that's the one thing that puts me off about this industry because, um, yeah, I, I would have more confidence in all honesty, be if I had a child being taught by um, a teacher whose first language isn't English, mm. because like we said before, the, yeah. um, it's being used to the grammar, it's being used to the structures, yeah. it's being used to um, a certain pedagogy mm. compared to English teachers who probably take for granted that they know everything, yeah. but they yeah. don't, you know. And, and usually people, thing. they say like the good thing about a native speaker is the pronunciation. Yeah. But yeah. like one thing is like, do you think like if you are a teacher group four hours a mm. week, do you think that will they will pick up seriously, or like realistically pick up the, the accent? Um, I think you sort of change your own thinking as, as time goes on, because I wasn't, when I first started, pronunciation, accents, it wasn't something I really thought about, but now I do because I think it's not so much about sounding like a, a native speaker, but it's actually thinking about um, the sounds individually because if you yeah. mispronounce then like you the mis short sounds long sounds yeah yeah I mean you if you mispronounce then you misspell if mm. you misspell then you don't make sense if you mm. don't make sense then you're not communicating mm. effectively um, what I've I'm very very lucky at the moment because I'm teaching just for primary school kids mm. all right? oh, wow. so, so I was like wow this is great but what's nice about that is that I feel like I'm actually doing a pilot study mm -hmm. and I started doing it last year and I really want to try and enforce it this year with the things like the books but phonetics from such an early age are really really important yeah and I think there's about 46 47 different sounds mm -hmm. in the English language if I can get my primary school kids to better pronounce if they can hear mm. these sounds if they can act out these sounds yeah. um, they that will stick with them longer than mm. it will be for adults because yeah. for adults yeah. it's going to be Im yeah. almost impossible yeah. um but it is interesting because you know i think here in algeria there is this sort of um uh, keen interest in mm. accents you know everyone's, yeah. everyone's sort of interested absolutely. in yeah. accent yeah. but then yeah. what is what is a british accent yeah you uh, know? absolutely yeah is it the rp is it yeah. the uh, is it i don't know is it from Li like liverpool is it Mm. Is it, I don't know, well, Cockney? I, I say to my students, if you can understand me, then your listening skills are very, yeah. very good. Uh -huh. Because the Liverpool accent is difficult. Mm. It is difficult to understand. And uh, on the BBC website, if, um, if your listeners have got mm. access to a smartphone or a laptop, um, if you go to the BBC website, you can listen to radio for free, which is great. 
What you can also do is not just listen to national radio, but mm. listen to local, local radio. Absolutely. And there must be, I think there's 40 different local radio stations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So there's BBC Radio Liverpool, there's BBC Radio mm. Manchester, there's BBC Radio Yorkshire. Yorkshire, yeah. 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 Um, and just by listening to those stations, you know, at random, taking a bit from here, a bit from there, you can actually hear yeah. these sounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah hear these accents some are easier to understand than others yeah. and I would imagine that BBC Radio London is yeah. probably the easiest one yeah. to listen to um, but that gives you an idea a flavour of, of exactly, the different yeah. accents but that's like that's tricky a little bit because what do what students don't know mm -hmm. is that for me I have I have this situation where students they come to me and they say my accent is not good which is silly the accent is it's mm. very good it's very intelligible uh -huh. it's easy to understand but I mean English now like if you think about it you learn English and if you think about the people you're going to communicate with yeah, yeah, yeah. you're going to communicate with way more non-native speakers mm -hmm. than actually native speakers sure sure and i was like from i was the other day reading this article saying that it is much more practical to learn what is called like an international english mm, yeah then if you like if you learn a local one Mm -hmm. Because maybe if you speak that local uh, English accent, you might not be understood by the non-native. That's right, yeah. And yeah. like, f when you think about it, like you, 90% of the people you communicate with are non-natives. Mm -hmm. So for me, what I, what I would like to say to my students is that don't stress out about your accent. Mm -hmm. I'm, this is what I think. But for you, like, like Stuart, what's... What do you think? Do you think it's crucial? Like when you hear someone speaking, I mean, do you do you pay attention to pronunciation? Uh, yeah, I, I should pay more attention to it. I think because of the reasons that we said. No, but, I mean not in teaching. Mm, like when you are just when conversing I, with someone. Um, it probably works both ways, doesn't it? Because what is language? What's the function of language? And mm. it's to communicate, isn't it? It's to, to put a point to your your, your point across so um, as long as I can go into a shop and buy what I need mm. so if I need coffee I can ask where is the mm. coffee and they show me and they give it to me and I pay for it well I've, I've achieved my objective I've achieved my aim yeah. uh, but the interesting thing is you know I've been listening to you Mehdi uh, your, your ideas and your thoughts and I, I can't understand what you're saying because of your Canadian accent to go with your Canadian ears <laughs> so we're talking about we're talking about accents but what is your because I'm listening to you and I'm thinking are you really Algerian or are you from North America I mean, where, um, where does this come from where does your accent come from a lot of uh, influence of American TV mm. I mean this is something that maybe you have noticed is that here in Algeria there is a bigger influence of American English mm. than British English. So for me, I've yeah, I've grew up, I've grown up watching a lot of Eng American movies and mm -hmm. a lot of American series, and it yeah. just yeah, it's just I started to pick up that yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that that accent, and it just I don't know, it's just it just came as a result of a lot of exposure, I would say, yeah. and uh, and it's I. I it, it appealed to me, mm -hmm. which is something really interesting because uh, I tell you what I like last year I was trying actually to learn the British accent. Really, oh I did. Words. I was like, start. Good to say, Lord, yeah. sir. I was like, Doctor, what's the matter? <laughs> <laughs> I was using a lot of schwas. Oh wow! And, uh, <laughs> I was what like, is a schwa? I'm asking myself. I don't know. What is it? Can you? <laughs> it's the sound you make. It's like it's like an article. Uh, oh, like, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, the dog. It's like doctor. <laughs> yeah. And it's like the silent R's because like English yeah. is British English is non-rhotic. So okay. for example, arm. Mm -hmm. American they say arm mm -hmm. with R, but arm. Um, British. Yeah, they would say arm or uh, I don't know, like harm. Mm. Yeah, heart. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but British, American, they would say heart, harm. Like, the, you hear the R. Yeah, it's really And I start doing that, you know, like, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. how you get there. That's right. But 
I didn't like it. I didn't feel comfortable. Really? Okay. Yeah, I mean, like, I was like, I don't know. I'm much more comfortable with the American accent. And then I said, mm. what's the difference? Yeah. Because there's this myth of the posh British accent. That whatever you say, <laughs> <laughs> you sound quite intelligent. <laughs> really? Oh, wow. I must practice my English accent. I was trying to practice that. It's like my belly button is itchy. <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> What's going on now? My favorite is it. Wow. It's like, it sounded quite intelligent. Wait, it's like, it does. I, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's it. I don't know. It, 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 the, talking about belly buttons, why is it that the belly button fluff is always blue? Why is it always blue? Uh, we would never know. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 think I, I think I have to invite someone like a specialist or right. something, like a doctor or Dr. something. Babel like, exactly, yeah. There's never one when you need one, is there? But that's yeah. the interesting thing. I mean, you were saying about the American, uh, uh, speaking with an American accent, and that's true, isn't it? I mean, have you noticed it? Like, haven't you noticed it in your classes? I've, I've noticed it amongst some of the teachers, yeah, because, uh, you know, <laughs> We're at the British Council, mm. and people yeah. think, <laughs> but people think that we sure. that British English is the best English, mm. okay? Because you know, Britain invented the the language because of being invaded by yeah. other countries, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But again, like we were saying off air, you know, about um, Americanization of the planet, mm. globalization, <clears> and. <throat> You know, when's the last time you watched a, a British film? Maybe Lockstock? That's or, true. That's um, true. So I'm, the influence of American culture is exactly. so much more British culture. Yeah, I mean, the the influence of the British British influence here, it's very slim. Mm, it's yeah, almost yeah. inexistent. Like for example, for me, I don't watch that much that often like programs like, yeah, British programs. Like the only not a lot of movies i'm a fan of movies but not i don't watch british movies but mm -hmm. it's just i would say that american ads it's much more commercialized mm -hmm. it's everywhere yeah yeah you know like hollywood they have this huge uh promoting power oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. so so i think that's it has to do with it that's yeah. that's one reason and um yeah, I mean, for me, sometimes like my students, they would say, we are at the British Council, like, why are you speaking American? I say, listen, I'll teach you how to say it, like pronunciation, British pronunciation, American pronunciation, choose the one you like. That's right. <laughs> it's like, you say heart, heart. If you like this, choose heart. <laughs> if you like harm, uh, heart, choose heart. Well, that's heart. what it comes down to. It's just <clears throat> the, the, the sound, isn't it? But it's not that yeah. crucial. It's like no, the no. most important is you, as long as you are intelligible. Yeah. Oh, yeah, especially in speaking. As we said before, it's a very mm. oral community. I mean, what's interesting is it's not just the American pronunciation, but it's also American spellings. Because in the <clears> course book, sometimes yeah. they go from English to American. Exactly. So you're, like you're changing color, the... Like color yeah, kind of with the... Changing the register. Yeah. Um, Flavor. Yeah. That's like right. British, like one O, but American... No. Uh, yeah. British O-U-R, American yeah. O-R. That's right, yeah. And, and I think a lot of the, the students don't know mm. that there is these different types. Yeah. Know? But I mean... It's is it crucial to know? I mean, these mm. things they can you can let yeah they you, you can let them slide you know oh yeah because yeah. they won't affect yeah I think it's the nuances it's the little things isn't it mm. I mean mm. what's what's really impressive is that um, you know working in at the school that we work in and some of the students in the the more advanced levels mm. you know the pronunciation is almost native like okay. But they've never left Algeria. That's they've incredible. never left Algeria. <clears throat> so where does it come from? You know, are you really Algerian or are you secretly it's, British? Yeah, or? I mean, you know, sometimes you would hear. We have like this um, teenagers group mm -hmm. at the BC. They are advanced, mm -hmm. and their level, they'll make your head spin. Mm -hmm. Seriously, like their level is, it's. It's excellent. Like you, if you want, yeah, if you want to know more about them, talk to Bernie, which right. is our colleague at the at the BC. She's teaching them now, and she's they, they are they're amazing. Mm -hmm. They use a lot. They use idioms, a lot of phrases, oh, right. okay. like effortlessly. Mm -hmm. They're like very comfortable. Yeah. How did they learn it? That's no it, idea. isn't it? You know, it's I would say lots of influence of, of lots of television. They. 
I'm sure that these kids they watch a lot of television, a lot of movies, a lot of, and it's just you know exposure. It's like as a child, it's it's. I think they're like replicating the the language acquisition of a child. Mm-hmm. Like how do a child learn a language? It's just by constant exposure. Yeah, he's just yeah. listening a lot to it, listening a lot to it, and he's trying to repeat. Mm-hmm. You know, like utter the same way, trying to replicate. <clears throat> and I think that's. That's how they got their accents, and yeah. they they didn't study. They didn't focus a lot on grammar and vocab, but they acquired it, yeah. which is I the think, most. Oh yeah. yeah, and I think that's what's great about um, the people who live across North Africa is just how easy it is to acquire language. I mean, yeah, not just you know the, the various dialects of yeah. Arabic, but also Spanish. I mean, you, how's your Spanish classes getting on today? Español es perfecto, amigo. Yo puedo hablar español hasta el fin del día. <laughs> oh, muy bien, muy bien. Very good. So, so there you go, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's how... Why is it that here people can absorb language yeah. much, much better than people in... I'll tell in you Europe, why. You know? I'll tell you why. You know, it's because of the French uh, influence. Because people here, they can speak French. And as you know, is historically speaking, I think in the century, 12th century, Normandy colonized England for three centuries. And what happened is that the French dominated, like took over English. And it almost like, English almost disappeared because of that. So as a, con- as a consequence, French was used in the high class, like in the courts, mm-hmm. king and yeah, everything. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> But what happened is that after that, when the Black Plague came, so the Black Plague, ironically enough, it's like the Black Plague was saved the <laughs> English le- language, you know, because yeah. because people like the uh, like royalties, they all died from from the plague, and the only people to survive were peasants, right. <laughs> and those peasants were the English people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because yeah, because the high court were French. Yeah, I feel like a peasant already at the British Council. When yeah. I see myself at the bottom, and then you got this sort of top tier management. <laughs> I know my place. So yeah, no, you're no, right. That's, that's yeah. really what happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know what's the beauty of English is that once the English took uh, control back, mm. they didn't omit the French words. You know, f- yeah, words related yeah. to law, for example, punishment. Mm-hmm. Uh, judge, yeah. they Advocate, all come yeah. from French. Yeah. Juge, uh, punition, or for example, uh, garde, mm-hmm. yeah, like uh, avant garde. And we see a lot of influence mm-hmm. in English. For example, we say uh, all the words, like for example, um, <clears throat> we say sometimes bon voyage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we use it in English. We say Allah, like for example, Allah English. Uh-huh. This, this, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's almost reversal because now the English are using these French expressions yeah. like bon voyage, yeah. joie de vie, you know, in C'est text, la vie. yeah, C'est in, la... in magazines to make us sound more uh, intelligent. Yeah, so I that mean, the peasants are trying to be to be more intelligent. No, but by what speaking. happened? What happened is that Flimsy they French. kept the French words, but they have slight different meanings. For mm. example. If I say commence, commence is French, mm-hmm. but if I say start, I cannot use them in the same way. Like mm-hmm. commence is much more formal. Yeah, yeah. So that's, uh, I mean, in a way, that's the beauty of English. In English, it's, it's a language that absorbs oh, other yeah. languages. Yeah. And it's like now, lastly, the last time I've checked, it's like the language with the richest vocabulary. Mm. And it's a, as a result of, of absorbing constantly yeah. absorbing uh, other other languages oh, yeah. which is which yeah. is yeah yeah it's just amazing and the thing is it, it's it it's organic like you say it's alive because yeah. you know the language of technology is english isn't it i mean i don't know absolutely in, in arabic you know is it facebook you know is mm. it twitter mm. is it uh, whatsapp i mean are people using these these words in yeah. english absolutely even yeah. though they might yeah, be yeah, 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 yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. And you know why I would say that Algerians are more apt at, at mm. learning English? Because they have a rich vocabulary in French that exists in English. Right. So they already have a head start. Yeah, yeah. So they true. just start to transfer knowledge. Mm. It's like, ah, oh, I know 
capable. In French, I say capable. I'm just going to change the pronunciation. I say mm. capable. Mm. I already know the concept of capable. I already know the meaning. You don't have to uh, define it or explain it to me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, capable or or uh, feasible. Ah, feasible. Ah, yeah, I know this word. Okay. So it's like you start just transferring knowledge. And and this is something that I would like to the audience to take uh, notice of. Mm -hmm. It's like you guys, you have an amazing opportunity because English is the first language in the world and you have this rich vocabulary that comes uh, from French. Mm. So, yeah. so then it works both ways around. <clears throat> so if I change my pronunciation, yep. then I can speak French. Mm. I'll be Absolutely. a fluent French speaker just by speaking with the French. You see, now, <laughs> okay. I hope now like, I motivated you to <laughs> There you learn. go, that's yeah, it, yeah, 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 absolutely. You have a head start, man. Oh, wow, yeah. that's good. I mean, the good thing is, I, I think that we might, we might come on to a bit later, but it is the sense that um, there is this sort of natural enthusiasm to learn English mm -hmm. here in a country where it is not readily available, uh, sure. which I think is that that's the, one of the things that stood out the most. Mm. Um, you know that we do teach students that that really want to learn English, yeah. even though it is hard in a capital city like Algiers yeah. to speak English to Absolutely, people. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah. Which bring a, brings us to mm. uh, <coughs> Algerian learners. Uh huh. So you have taught learners of different nationalities yeah. and my question I'm curious to know your thoughts on Algerian learners so what are what are the characteristics how would you describe them comparing to others yeah yeah well I think there's you know I feel blessed to to actually teach Algerian students I mean that that is that's the, the best recommendation I can say really from my experience here is that Algerians really do want to learn and like we said before there is this you know you can teach speaking reading writing listening but you can't teach motivation you can't teach enthusiasm you can't teach that's, dedication yeah. which is the key and that's it yeah, which is the key which I think here in in Algeria people have it you know, in the bucket loads, they have lots of this and they bring that to classes. You know, we mm. teach mm. late at night, you know, the weather's changing, it's dark, it's oh, cold. Yeah. I hate it, man. Yeah. Um, but my <laughs> students, my students are really positive. You know, they, they come, their attendance is good. They ask questions, they make notes. Um, and that's a real pleasure because coming from, as I say, my last job, uh, Morocco, the English language is so much more evident there than it is here. Really? Yeah, much, much more. I mean, yeah. again, you know, there are these brands, these uh, multinationals. Yeah. yeah, and they, they bring the language of the language of English, but they yeah. also bring the culture as well with them. You know, it's easy to buy books, it's easy mm. to buy magazines um, in English. In English, yeah. I mean, the, the, there was the cinemas that show English films maybe once a week, so the, the culture is there, but. Their attitude towards learning English is not there. And I thought coming to Algeria, it would be difficult mm. because without this, without those examples mm. here, um, students would be sort of less motivated. But no, not, not at all. It's been completely the opposite. Um, it's probably to the point where it's almost a bit too enthusiastic <laughs> when it comes to speaking. I mean, I've had to. We're getting to the last week. All of, excess is bad. Oh man! <laughs> All kinds of excess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's the thing. I had to, I had to like tell off my my adult students the other night just because they just spoke too much. Mm. Uh, In and, English, I hope. And, yeah, and I think probably... The worst thing that, that they would be speaking well, Arabic. Well, that's it. And that, that's what was happening in, in oh. Morocco. Oh, wow. they, they, came oh, okay. to, they came to practice the Arabic and French in class. Uh, but I had to, I had to tell off my, 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 my students. And that, that's one thing I would say is that, um, yeah, people like speaking in Algeria. Mm. All right? And they're very good at it, which is great, which is really good. Um, but it, it, there's so much more to learning a language than just the speaking. It is the, the more academic yeah. disciplines, the, yeah. the, especially the writing. Mm -hmm. um, so my students just wouldn't stop talking. You know, mm -hmm. I'm standing at the front, so I'm trying to sort of, you know, prepare them for this writing exercise. Mm -hmm. To the point where, you know, I left my classroom and went for a coffee. Like mm -hmm. I went to the, uh, I went outside and just had an espresso, mm -hmm. and I came back in, and then they'd been a little bit quieter because they wondered where I went to, but. Mm -hmm. Um, in some ways, it, when it's late at night, I was really like, uh, really sort of upset and angry. But then, with the benefit of sleeping and, and coming back the next day, I actually thought, well, do you know what? Maybe it's not such a bad thing. Yeah. You know? um, 
Yeah, but one thing I think you should take into consideration is that the need, learning needs. I think here in Algeria, people, they need English more for speaking. Mm. I mean, if you if you pay attention to, uh, like, if you think about our students, they are doctors, businessmen, they are, I don't know, finance manager, blah, blah, blah. They mostly need, Eng mostly, I'd say, not all, but most of them, they just needed to give presentations, to maybe write emails, yeah. to talk with, with, with people. So at the end, for me, I, I, I share the same opinion as you, but sometimes I think, do they need writing? Mm. Writing is amazing. I mean, if I only could, like if, if I could tell my students, focus on writing, write more because they don't write a lot. Yeah. I mean, sometimes when I correct their copies, I see just, like the most basic yeah, mistakes, yeah, yeah. which is like punctuation. They mm. cannot oh, yeah. Yeah. use proper punctuation. Sure, sure. But I tell myself, do they really need it? You know, yeah, what, you know what I mean? It, it's, it, that's it. it. It's us imposing our values, isn't it? Because we, we think of ourselves as a school and we, we're teaching to the test. So <clears throat> when students are assessed, you know, it's is it 12.5% yeah. or something on yeah. each of the four skills. So like I said in the meeting a few weeks ago, maybe because the students, like you say, you know, they don't come necessarily mm. to spend two hours how to write. They mm. want to spend two hours speaking. Yeah. Maybe we need to sort of put more emphasis on speaking and less on the more academic mm, skills yeah. but you know that's a pedagogic yeah, issue yeah isn't it? depend because i think they come out of practical reasons mm. they want to use english like uh, in to work like for work to communicate because mostly it's career related mm -hmm. like for me uh, for uh, my personal experience talking with students they just want to have better jobs they mm -hmm. just want to study abroad okay that the ones who wants to who want yeah to study abroad it's a bit different because they need writing in that mm -hmm. case yeah they will write a lot of essays and everything but most of them are like uh, workers office workers and um, doctors and yeah so on and so forth so they just want to yeah they just want to have better career yeah, yeah. opportunities and yeah. uh, for me I've got to respect that mm. you know like if someone wants to speak so i'm going to spend my time doing that practicing that skill if at the end like i will spend a lot of time teaching writing but he won't use it and especially writing it's to get better at writing you've got to write mm -hmm. you know like practice makes uh, it is yeah yeah oh absolutely yeah it's a skill yeah. that if you don't practice you, yeah. you'll become a bit rusty but i think it's interesting i mean you've you're you've taught or you're teaching business students this time? I've taught, yeah, 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 I've taught last term. So in some of those units, so, you know, they say, you know, how to prepare a CV. Now, yeah. do people, in the nicest sense of the word, do people yeah. write CVs here? Or is it, again, more of a cultural thing where it's, you know, I know there's somebody who has a job mm. and they know somebody and if I speak to that person, yeah. they might. They do, but they don't do it uh, the right way. Mm. It's not like... Uh, they don't respect the methodology. It's, okay. like it's not up to standards. Mm. So, but since there are a lot of people who do it the wrong way, it's just something that we yeah. just uh, let slide. And, and that's the thing, isn't mm. it? I mean, for, for those students, like you say, that, that aspire, they want to go to Europe or to Canada. Yeah. yeah. That's where the writing comes yeah. in because that's that's part of the process. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if they apply for something abroad and they, they would use the CVs they use here. Yeah, it will definitely be a disadvantage for them. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, for me, it's just maybe sort of the, it's like a pendulum, and it's sort of swinging maybe slightly away from speaking more towards mm. the writing because the writing, as a teacher, gives you the opportunity to assess in more detail because you can actually see our students true. using vocabulary, yes, grammar. Very true. Um, I mean, we have to do two writings uh, a term, but what I say to the students is. You know, we give them these notebooks every term mm. and, you know, they make notes and that's great, you know, uh, some of them don't bother, some of them just scribble and draw in them, you know. But what I say is that use it as either a dictionary, use it to collect words, phrases, expressions, like idioms mm. that, that you can remember. Uh, but also use it as a diary, you know, mm. use it to write in Absolutely. every day. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And it's just for you to, to write in it, you know, don't show anybody it's personal. Exactly, yeah. And then you can use all different forms. You yeah. can use the present tense, 
Um, the past tense is future tense is yeah. what you're going to do yeah. next week or next month. And they just like Three realize things. the lack, the weaknesses. Like mm. if you start writing, you would realize that you are lacking vocab because you don't know how to express yeah, an yeah. idea. So this yeah. will push you to go to the dictionary, mm. look it up, learn a new word, build your vocabulary, come back and write oh, it. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's very unfortunate, but we highly, we highly advise uh, mm -hmm. our students. Yeah. Diary is great. Uh, I have my own diary and... Uh, <gasps> Let's read it. Let's see what you've written. Uh, I don't know. I don't think you want to read it. Read, read down there. My darkest thoughts. Really? Uh, oh, uh, even better. <laughs> even better. Where is it? Where is it? <laughs> let me take... Let me take off the like the uh, the parts where they're still it. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's episode four. I think that's episode four, isn't it? No, I've written Stuart. And it's another nice thing. Guy. And I, I hate him. I hate this guy. I hate the way he, I hate the way he blinks. Today I was I was like close to kill Stuart. <laughs> I was like that close. That close. <laughs> He's got to, yeah, he gets into my nerves. That's he it. rubs me the wrong way. <laughs> and that's it. Isn't it? I think we, we spend so much time in the staff room. We, we are like this. Um, I suppose in some ways we are like a family and we do have our ups and downs there. Yeah. It's like a disjointed, dysfunctional, yeah. like the Simpsons, really, isn't it? But, uh, <laughs> I hope like we don't, sometimes like Sharaf and I, like we don't annoy you like with our overjoyness. <laughs> yeah, you do. I know. You do. <laughs> it's like, this is the, this is the we have to do that now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, we'll go nuts. We have, like, we have a, yeah, true. No, but I think this is this is the cultural thing. And again, it's like being a stiff ass Brit. It's it's the fact that Brits are very sensible. You know, they don't really um, socialize outside of their circles. You know, and uh, again. You know, it, it, it's been adaptive. It's me, you know, coming to to, to your country, to your um, culture, your your the, your way of being, and for me, adapting. I think that again, that that can only be a good thing, really. You know, how how change. But there's a part of me that would love it to be like the German council. I just think it'd be so efficient. You know, everything would be done on time. There wouldn't be any mess. This like we won't have that early registration That's problem. That's right. We will have like to uh, just be so spend one hour like explaining to students why we failed them. That's right. Oh, man. It's like yeah. everything. So I think there should be, I think it should be more sort of yeah. uh, German influence. Yeah, I mean, if, if there is a German company that wants to uh, come here, <laughs> yeah. you've got two potential <laughs> employees who know the market, That's right. know the target audience. <laughs> yeah, the perfect, the perfect candidates. <laughs> but it's nice to see, um, you know, somebody from the country, from the yeah. city, actually uh, in a position of, of yeah. influence. And then that's the thing that carries it on because then I think, well, if Amina can do it, then then, then so can I, you yeah. know, sort of thing. Whether you'd want to do it, that's yeah. the thing because exactly. it is a lot of hassle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I do think there is a there is a culture of bullying at the British Council, yeah. which is. Which is, and I, I feel ashamed to be British because I think a lot of it is not, not even not only from like mm -hmm. the uh, British staff, it's mm -hmm. even from the Algerian staff. I mean, there at the British Council there is um, <coughs> a status quo. I mean, if you stay for long at the British Council, you need to conform to a certain type of personality or a certain type of employee. Okay, it's like. If look like think about it like if when Sandra came, it's like Sandra is she's new, she's not that different from Bill. It's like you can feel that there is this BC profile. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah. So it's like either you embrace it or either you opt. Yeah. But if yeah. you want to go far, if you want to climb climb up the scale, you have got to. Well, that's it. It is. It's the politics. You have to play the system mm. a little bit. Exactly. Um, yeah. But there's things that you can do to sort of have a little bit of cheeky fun along the way. Oh yeah. You yeah. can sort of, uh, if you sort of uh, outsmart them, which is always nice. Which yeah. Is, you know, yeah. You feel like satisfied. <laughs> that's I've what used... life's all about. Absolutely. <laughs> I've used my my, my mind. I I outsmarted the. Uh, that's right. I bullshitted the bullshitter. <laughs> 
Wow, I feel like we have been talking for ages now. It's the, the second half. At the oh, end. I've, I've only just warmed up. I've only just started. Are you uh, ready for another three hours? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm not. <laughs> this is uh, this is like an insight into what it's like to, to be in my house at Christmas time <laughs> when everyone's speaking at the same time. So actually, there's no difference between my house, <coughs> my family and teaching Algerian students. Oh, wow. Okay, before we end, um, I would like to ask you, yeah, the last bit, which is related about to top tips. Mm -hmm. So, we're gonna start off with teachers. So, as an experienced teacher, as a teacher who has taught learners from of different nationalities, um, you are a native speaker. What, what tips could you give to, especially young teachers, yeah. which is graduated yeah i mean it's i think that having come off the celta it is those first few years are getting used to the job of being a teacher i think you know it is just um <clears throat> going into teacher mode you know knowing what to do uh, and it comes with repetition i remember you know when i start well yeah as a teacher in britain and also doing teaching in other countries always used to write a lesson plan mm. always i mean religiously write a lesson plan mm -hmm. um with what i was going to do with the the questions the answers and i, I kept them in uh, in these in these books you know these very <coughs> cheap notebooks and yeah. I used to tick them off as i did it and i felt good about myself i felt like you know i was I knew what I was doing because of this sort of reinforcement, this this thing of doing it again and again mm, and again. Absolutely. So unfortunately, to begin with, I think it is having to um, do the repetition, to do the simple things, but make sure the simple things are done really well. You know, it's the planning, the preparation. Yeah. Um, but like anything, with time, then it becomes second nature. Yeah. And then I think what's great is that when you can actually go away yourself without being yeah. told or instructed and think, well, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. If I do like this instead, this will produce a better outcome. Yeah. Well, that, that's, that's, yeah. that's when you've cracked it. Uh, that's, I, I totally agree with you with, with lesson planning. I think that it is crucial to lesson plan at the beginning. Mm -hmm. If you are a new teacher, don't take, don't take shortcuts. Mm -hmm. Stick, yeah, stick to that. Yeah, like take the time to plan like take the time to really do a great a, a great lesson plan because i think for me the first year was all about lesson planning mm. but the good thing is that the second we the second year was easier because i had lesson plan the first year and then i was just yeah. recycling a lot of things that i did oh, yes. but if i took a shortcut it would have been harder mm. I, it would have been like every time you have to reinvent the wheel every time like you you have taught present simple last time and then you have present simple this time i have to plan for it again yeah yeah so yeah. the best thing uh to do is to plan for it once plan for it well uh -huh. and then you will just like archive it and, and just keep it yeah and use it anytime oh absolutely yeah yeah and it's it's amazing just how many materials are out there but like you say you know if you're oh, able yeah. to archive your own materials mm -hmm. then again it just reduces the time because you know the time that we spend in the staff room that that's the that's almost like the worst part of the job the best part is being in the classroom and delivering the material mm. so if you feel tired if you feel stressed if you feel frustrated that you're not able to actually um create your own lesson plan mm. then when you go into the classroom you're not going to deliver yeah. and yeah. and i think students can see that very very quickly yeah. so with time, it reduces Absolutely. your planning, and yeah. that means you're yeah. more fresh when you yeah, start teaching. Yeah. And it's and at the same time, it's a build-up. Mm. I mean, you perfect your act as you go, uh -huh. because I have seen like with sometimes with new teachers, they want to to deliver a perfect lesson every time. Sure. Which is like ideal. It's it's like an ideal, but realistically speaking, it's just impossible. Uh -huh. I'd like to teach that ideal lesson once. <laughs> if you could do it, <laughs> Just yeah. Just once, and yeah, I'd be happy about that. that. Happy. Yeah. But, uh, but it is hard, yeah. And it's, uh, you know, it, it's really tough. I mean, it, it, and it, again, it just comes down to learners, doesn't it? Mm. I think a lot of teachers, especially during the CELTA, they do it for adults, and then mm. when they're given a primary class oh, yeah. for the first time, it's they, like, what? 
watch this. The struggle is real. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you earn your money. That's when a two-hour lesson becomes a four-hour lesson. It's if you training, man. I mean, yeah. it's like you you speak louder. You have to speak more. And it's like after two hours, you are drained. Yeah, and yeah. Like you're worn out, and you're like you are looking for that coffee, a <laughs> cup of coffee, just to get you through uh, your day. I mean, for me, I I don't teach any primaries now, and I'm not um, looking forward to that <laughs> at the present moment. What What's been the difference? Do you think this year compared to last year? What's been the biggest difference for you? Um, the biggest difference is that I don't have to plan what I already planned mm -hmm. you know okay. I I have a lot of uh, materials ready and um, experience as well yeah but yeah. that's the thing like I have built up my own uh, materials stock mm -hmm. so now whatever whatever like for example if I'm teaching prison prison perfect boom I, in my head I know exactly what lead-in I can use because I have tested it mm -hmm. like I know that this lead-in will work sure, because sure. I've tested it I've tried it many times and it works so I don't have to think about it okay um, I know what free practice might be suitable for this type of grammar or this type of vocab yeah so it just now I focus more I plan less and uh, I spend less time way less yeah, yeah, in yeah. planning because yeah I've built up and you know one of the things like I Shortly after CELTA, I've understood that it's impossible to deliver a perfect lesson every time. Yeah. But it's it's a process. It's it's practice. Um, like practice makes perfect, and you learn with experience. Like for example, you teach present perfect first time, then you get new ideas. Like ah, oh, I can use it. I can teach it this way. Mm -hmm. Then you teach it that way, and then ah, oh, this is really good. But maybe it needs a little bit of tweaking. And then yeah, yeah. yeah you improve it. And then until you reach that version that you are satisfied with, you say, sure. okay, that's it, that's good, it, it's, it's, uh, I can rely on it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what, what, uh, that's the difference. And also it's um, the confidence you build. I mean, yeah. the more you teach, the more confidence you have. It's not, I remember like, for example, if they, if they told me like a year ago that I'm going to cover two years, uh, two hours before, mm -hmm. I was like stressed what? the hell out. Like I wouldn't be stressed out and start sh like shaking and and yeah, getting sweaty and yeah, yeah, yeah. But now it's like, okay, I have some tricks up my sleeves. Uh -huh. Let's do this. Uh, <laughs> Let's get good. these. Yeah, good. these uh, students. Yeah. yeah, it's you get that that confidence and. Yeah. But again, I would like to re reiterate that, that this confidence comes with hard work. <coughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, you've got to don't take shortcuts like that's that's a, an essential like thing to do. It's 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 crucial. Don't take shortcuts. Plan your lessons properly and it will pay off. It yeah. will pay yeah huge dividends in, in the future. And uh, hopefully it will get easier and easier. But always for me, it's interesting to learn new things mm -hmm. it's there is a trap it's trap to get complacent and just to be yeah you get used to your comfort zone and you feel oh, okay i'm confident now got some experience mm -hmm. that's and you stop learning yeah Big that's mistake. true that's yeah. true i mean it, what's nice is that we as a school always seem to employ new teachers you know there's that nqt program yeah. that starts so um, what would be your advice to an NQT teacher? What would you say to yourself last year that you now know yourself? Um, <clears throat> as I said, plan your lessons, lower your expectations. Like, don't ex as I said, don't expect to be perfect every time. Mm -hmm. You are a teacher. You have a heavy. Uh, you have a very busy timetable. It's okay to sometimes uh, teach, like go in a classroom half prepared. Mm -hmm. It happens. Yeah, yeah. It's the yeah. nature of the job. Don't stress about it. Uh, and sometimes it, those lessons are the best ones, aren't they? Because you, true, you don't know where they're gonna go. True, <laughs> students don't know where they're gonna go, but I mean, you get the at the end, don't you? And, yeah, that's um, true. And also in terms of planning, you know, 
teaching is a very it's it's a, it's life you mm -hmm. know it's like everything can happen in in while you are teaching so when you plan don't don't be obsessed about like um about delivering or, or applying your plan like the way, exactly the way you have planned it. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. It's like plan the headlines, mm -hmm. plan the headlines. Right. But the way you get from one point to another, you just you just have to adapt to the classroom. Because mm -hmm. for for me, one of the mistakes I have made maybe in, uh, at the beginning of my career is that sometimes you have planned something, but on the spot you discover that students they don't need you to teach them that point they know it yeah so yeah, you gotta yeah. think on your feet and mm. and just so the mistake i made or the mistakes i made is that i would do it anyway yeah, it's yeah. in the plan <laughs> that's right <laughs> i gotta go over it so i cannot like i cannot yeah i cannot in the divert book, from the plan yeah and that's what makes the hard job the job hard isn't it because we we are assuming students know this we are assuming students don't know this but how can we assume that how can we know that completely we don't do we i mean in a class there's such a wide uh, mixture of ability True. um and you sort of have to almost teach in the middle yeah so those that don't know it get something from it those that already know it get a little bit more revision mm -hmm. and that is hard you know yeah. to try and picture yeah. the right yeah, level yeah, yeah. and i would say the last thing is keep keep uh, learning mm -hmm. keep learning keep reading keep stay curious about teaching because you will enjoy it even more you know it, there's so like it's very exciting when you when you read something new about teaching and you would feel that it will add a value to your teaching and to your students and you go like yeah very very impatiently very excited like and you go and try it in in your classroom yeah. and you see like different something different and you see that there is there is like it there is a different something different in your in your teaching that sometimes your students might might uh, notice I, i'll give you an example last year i have taught elementary four students mm -hmm. and i got the same group after in pre-intermediate three okay right when i taught them in elementary four i was at the very beginning of my uh my work at at the british council yeah and when I taught them in pre and three, it was like a year after. Mm. And when we did the mid midterm ca counseling, and I talked with one student, and she's like, she was like, it's completely different. Like you way of teaching before and now is completely different. Mm. It's it's way better. It's it's uh, yeah, it's way better. And I said, I know. It's like I have more experience now. But the thing is, is that I kept learning things you know uh -huh. i kept learning things and always try to try something different and that's that that allows you to to keep loving teaching because if you stay if you are complacent you stop learning it will become a routine mm. you might start hating going to the classroom you might you you will get into this automatic mode oh yeah, yeah. and you will yeah. lose the passion you will lose yeah. the fire yeah. and for me the best is keep learning it's an ocean mm -hmm. it's an ocean like you can never assume that's it i have reached this point that's it i'm, I'm yeah i I'm, I'm the best now like even if we take uh, famous writers like i don't know scott thornbury or or uh -huh. these guys are always writing books yeah, yeah. they're always learning they, they didn't they didn't stop so yeah yeah this is yeah. what i would say next question We've talked about teachers. Now it is time to talk about uh, learners. Um, I have a, I have an anecdote I want to share with you. These last day, I have, I'm teaching beginner three uh, group, right? And I've got this student who's a beginner. He's a very keen student mm -hmm. to learn English, and he came to me and he was like very enthusiastic and he just simply asked me. How can I improve my English? He's just like, he was very enthusiastic. He wanted mm. to make the jump, you know? Yeah, yeah. He's like eager to learn. <laughs> so Stuart, what would you answer right. to the students? His name is Mohammed. <laughs> this is, uh, yeah, for you, Mohammed. I hope you're doing well. <laughs> Hi, Mohammed. 
Well, I think that the, like we've been saying um, this afternoon is that um, it's the enthusiasm, isn't it, that you can't teach. So it's the enthusiasm, motivation, and I think what's interesting at where we work is that students are really keen to go through levels very, very quickly, mm-hmm. which is fantastic. Sure. That's, that's great. Um, so what I would say is, it's like anything, it, it's, it's repetition, it's doing things, but it's doing things that you enjoy doing. Absolutely. And even if it's five minutes a day, then that's better than you know, doing nothing. Okay, so I would say that think about what you like to do in French and Arabic, you know, if you like to read a certain type of um, narrative, a certain type, type of, uh, of genre, uh, if you like to watch um, certain types of programs, your interests, you know, reading materials, but try and find the same subject, but this time in English, so that you've got some reference points. So, for instance, um, you know, if you like music, there's an awful lot of music um, blogs, music stations, music websites. If you like listen to a certain band and you read about them in French, then see if you can read about the same band in English and see if that can add to your, your knowledge or understanding. Uh, because it's really important to, t- to, I think, to learn about things that you enjoy learning mm-hmm. about. Which again, as teachers, we sort of assume students like to, to learn this subject or this topic to put into a context. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. You know, I mean, I was teaching about the farm in my class uh, last week and, you know, here in Algiers, do people have much reference to a farm? Do they know what a farm is? Do they know what it's used for? Are they really that interested in the farm? Like people in England are, are sometimes not that, that interested. So I'd say, Mohammed, you know, the key thing is to carry on. It sounds like you're really motivated. I'm sure you'll be in advanced very soon. Um, but try and do the same activities in English that you do in French and Arabic normally. And and that, that that will keep your enthusiasm going, I think. Also see English as yeah, don't see it as exercises, as you know, question one, question two, question three. Try and put what we do in the classroom into the mm. real world, you know, and, and that can only be a good yeah. thing. Good stuff. Mm-hmm. Man, I've got a bad news. Uh, this was my last question for you. Oh uh, no. Please don't make it the last yeah. question. <laughs> it means I've got to go back on your mobile. Oh yeah, <laughs> I've got to go this back. This is a good. A good it was. <laughs> I was. I was. It was. It was great. As I said to you on the back, it, it's only the third time that I've been on a motorbike, and I think we went on the motorway mm. a little bit. Yeah. And that's when I was a little bit scared. I, that's when <laughs> well, I was scared in the good way because it's like excited. Yeah. Like the rush of adrenaline. It was because yeah. I've been so. I have been boring since I've been in Algeria. <laughs> and I think sometimes when you're outside of your comfort zone and you do something that's a bit dangerous, it's a bit yeah, different. Yeah. It's like, wow, isn't yeah. life great? Stimulate. Isn't life great? So <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to that experience again. Well, we're looking forward to have you here. With All us. right. <clears throat> All right, folks. Unfortunately, we have reached the end of this episode. Oh. Yes, I know. Stuart, thank you very much for coming. The end is near, <laughs> and so I face. Keep going. <laughs> Sing the whole, tr- I can the whole track. Um, th- but also thank you, the audience, for sticking around and listening. Yeah. Um, Stuart, do you have any last words? Um, just, uh, this is the first time I've done something like this, and it's been great. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you for inviting me, Mehdi. Um, I'm sure you'll have lots of guests on your shows in the, in the weeks and months to come because we have got a lot of members of staff that would mm, love to do this. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and anything that we can do this afternoon that can help other people with their English can only be a yeah. good thing. So, so that's great. That's yeah. really, really good. All right, folks. This is the end of the episode. If you like the episode, don't forget to press like and share it with your friends. If you want more podcasts, press subscribe. This way you will receive updates of my upcoming publications. Thank you again for listening. I'm your host, Mehdi, and this was another episode of Mehdi's Mic, a series where we make English learning and teaching easier, one podcast at a time.